So uh, good evening. Thank you so much for having me. As Andrew said, I'm a cooperative extension specialist. I mostly focus on ecological restoration, which is mostly sort of uh, management of plants on arid systems. And I'm in the School of Natural Resources in the Environment. And we're going to talk a little bit today about how dang hard it is to do rain sheeting, but there's there's some hope, okay? So when I talk about rain sheeting, particularly even tonight, there's certainly sort of the benefit of, of forage production, right? So either through uh, seeding of native plants or seeding of non-native desired forage species. But I would encourage everyone when they're thinking about rain sheeting to not only sort of um, unilaterally think about forage production when they're seeding, but think about all the other things that can come from seeding just forage species or maybe seeding native species with some forage species. And this is both above ground benefits you can get. So um, pollinator habitat and um, wildlife habitat, as well as below ground, um, below ground effects. So things like uh, carbon sequestration and um, enhancing the water holding capacity of your uh, system. And of course, we know that most of this is due to the robust root structure of plants, right? So plants are really, really good at um, growing these large root structures and holding on to the soil to keep it from going away and to keep out invasive plants, to um, enhance nutrients in the soil. And I think it's really important for us to keep in mind that when we talk about rain sheeting, it doesn't necessarily need to be a conversation only about forage production because there's all these other benefits that come along with it. And when you're thinking about all the other benefits, um, any for me anyway, it's easier to think of um, sort of attempting to apply management and strategies from other areas to attempt to address some of the challenges associated with range seeding. The biggest challenge being that it's super hard to do well, right? So we know that range seeding is super hard. Um, the most recent uh, review that I saw it was actually published a little while ago in 2016 by Stuart Hardegree and Associates, and they found that 5% uh, of the stuff we put on the ground actually ends up turning into adult plants that produce other seeds. And that's a dismal, abysmal number. Um, and this probably isn't a um, surprise to anyone here, right? So uh, Stuart Hardegree, when they did this review, uh, most of that work that they looked at was mostly done by BLM in the western part of the United States on mostly uh, the Great Basin, so in cheatgrass dominated systems. These are areas that are seeded uh, after fire from airplanes. And so, you know, it isn't sort of the, the ideal conditions of rain seeding, right? You'd, you'd like to do sort of seeding at lower elevation, having some soil prep, but, you know, really we know that despite all this, rain seeding is incredibly hard, but it's not impossible, okay? And so it's hard for lots of different reasons, but I think despite the myriad of reasons that sort of restricts uh, rain seeding success, we can kind of, um, or I like to think of it as um, due to kind of two main reasons. One being rain, right? So um, we don't get a lot of rain in the Southwest and um, rain is infrequent and it's unpredictable. So you might Get this beautiful germinating rain one day and then not get anything for two months and then all those beautiful seeds that germinated all the um, little seedlings will die and the other thing is is that um, dealing with the plant materials themselves so keeping seed on the ground until germinating rain is really difficult i think it's actually more difficult than we think um, so seed can die if it doesn't rain soon enough because just from solar stress and desiccation stress um, wind can blow seed away, obviously. There's tons of seed eating animals. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the fact that ants can move like literally thousands of pounds of seed in six nights. So it's really hard keeping the seed on the ground. And then of course, once seed germinates, you have this like delicious tender green stuff that's just out for a buffet for all the animals out there that are eating it. So there's multiple levels of um, challenges associated with successful rain seeding. But what I wanted to do tonight is try to inject a little bit of optimism and try to address some of these challenges um, separately and then tell you guys about some of the recent work that people have been doing to try to directly address these challenges to enhance range seeding success overall, okay? So I'm gonna start with the, the, the rain issue, right? So um, rain is scarce, it's becoming more scarce and even more problematic than sort of low average precipitation is the fact that we usually aren't that good at knowing when it's gonna come. 
And when rain comes, it's often not followed by rain. So maybe everyone here has a neighbor that was super lucky and did spend a bunch of money on the seed, put it all out, and they were super lucky that it rained that day. The seed germinated, and then a week later it rained. So all those germinating seedlings were kept alive. Then it rained another week and another week. And that neighbor might talk about all the things that they did to prep the soil surface and the expensive seed they bought and all these things they did to enhance the probability that they were gonna get a successful range seeding. And all that stuff was probably helpful, but the most important part of that story is likely that they were super lucky with the rain, okay? So what do we do? Because we can't control rain, right? And most people here aren't seeding on irrigated pastures. So we need to try to address the fact that rain doesn't come very often, um, it's really unpredictable and it's infrequent. And the two main ways that I think that people can address this challenge is by choosing sites in an area that they wanna see that provide these slight localized protection from drought effects. And these areas can either be already out on the landscape and then you can leverage them and utilize them, or you can deploy structures that actually um, uh, provide these slight localized protection from drought effects. So the first thing I wanna talk about is uh, trying to leverage stuff that you've already got out on the landscape. So identifying fertile islands. So what I mean by fertile islands is let's say this is your, this is one of your favorite pastures and you want to um, seed it to get a little bit more um, high protein co uh, content forage. And you're gonna do it by hand. So if you're not gonna use a drone or a plane to drop the seed all over the place, and this is a couple hundred acres, you might, not want to see the entire area. So what you might do is attempt to identify locations across your um, focus area that you might be more likely to be successful with rain shame. So for example, you might see it around the hill toe slope because this area is protected from wind. It gets a little bit more shade during the day. You might choose depressions, natural depressions in the ground where you know when it does rain at least, these areas will fill with water and probably be moist for longer periods of time. And if they're depressions, the seeds are less likely to blow away. You might choose rocky sites. So rocky sites are awesome because not only do you have shading of the soil surface by these rocks, so you have cooler surface temperatures and a little bit more soil moisture, but often in rocky sites, seeds don't blow away as quickly. And then when seedlings start growing, they're kind of protected a little bit more from herbicides from herbicides, from herbivores, uh, it's late, sorry. Um, and finally, you might seed under canopies. And so this is under canopies of uh, trees and shrubs. And this is what I wanna focus on when I'm talking about um, fertile islands. So most of you are probably seeing something like one of these two pictures out on the landscape. So fertile islands, sort of the definition describes um, an area under a um, woody plant, so a tree or a shrub, that hosts a uh, plant community that, that is different in identity, density, or health than sort of the outside areas, okay? So in the right picture, you can see that under this mesquite, you have this nice um, bunch grasses, I guess they're native, they look kind of native, I don't know. Um, you've got these nice bunch grasses that seem to kind of peter out once maybe you get outside of the canopy. And there's lots of reasons why this happens, right? So when you're under a canopy, the branches above you are shading the soil surface. So you have lower surface temperatures. You've got less likely, um, less likely to find death of seeds or death of seedlings. Um, you get a little bit more soil moisture that stays in the ground because there's, it's a little less hot at the soil surface. You also often have a lot of litter that falls from the um, woody canopy. And so you have uh, this influx of nutrients into the soil. Plus, particularly for mesquite and some of the other leguminous trees that we've got around here, um, these guys have these root systems that host a bunch of beneficial bacteria and fungi that might also be really, really um, beneficial for your plants here. Um, so these are excellent areas in which to target for seeding. You're way more likely to get um, uh, germination and establishment under these areas. And these areas might even protect your uh, vulnerable growing seedlings from herbivory. So um, the, the branches of the trees might keep uh, livestock from actually going in and eating some of your vulnerable um, seedlings. And sometimes the root systems and branches can keep out some of the smaller herbivores. I'm not gonna get into, there, there's actually this huge debate in the sort of restoration world anyway about um, 
keeping livestock on land, keeping land in production after you seed. Um, some people have this knee jerk reaction and say, you know, once you seed, you should keep livestock off the land for a couple of years. Um, there's actually a bunch of literature that says that's not the case at all. If you seed and you put livestock back immediately, livestock can actually be really good for rain seeding and restoration because when you have the livestock walking out on the landscape after you seed, they're actually enhancing soil to seed contact. So you're less likely to lose seed through um, wind. And of course, when the animals are pooping and peeing out there, there's all this beneficial um, uh, nutrients out there. Um, I haven't done actual tests on that kind of stuff, so I'm not going to present that here, but I love talking about it, and I am very for kind of putting animals out right after you do seed. But anyway, so that's another benefit of fertile islands. And fertile islands, when you seed in these areas, you might think, okay, I got a bunch of trees out there, I can seed under them, and then what? My cows can't even get to this area. But really, fertile islands, the way they're supposed to work is that they enhance growth right at the sort of localized um, area under the canopy and then they can grow out. So here, this is showing some spread that you can typically find with fertile islands. They're calling these restoration islands, but it's the same thing. So you can get this bullseye nucleation where you get like these plants doing really, really well under the um, canopy and then they produce lots of seed and then they start just growing out till they go outside of the can canopy. And you can also get patch nucleation where some wind or an animal will bring seed from outside of the canopy and then you start developing these patches around the canopy. Okay, so that's one way that you can sort of leverage existing infrastructure, if you will, on your landscapes to enhance um, uh, rain seeding. But let's say you don't have a lot of trees or you don't have enough that it would make it worth your while. Well, you can actually deploy structures that can mimic some of the benefits to protect your seeds and seedlings against the effects of drought. Um, and the two I'm gonna to talk to you about today are rock lunas and branch piles. So rock lunas, if you haven't heard about them, I love rock lunas. I get very excited when I talk about rocks, it's amazing. Um, I think I was a geologist in the past, but I'm not really sure. But um, rock lunas are essentially uh, above ground structures of rocks and the lunas just uh, sort of describes the general half moon shape that you usually find these guys in. Um, they're pretty large, sort of at their thickest point. I guess you could say maybe they're six feet across, but they can be about 30 feet long. And the way they were traditionally used um, was not for sort of um, forage management or plants, it was really for erosion control. So if you um, uh, strategically sort of put these guys out on the landscape, the idea is that you've got water moving in the direction towards the concave, convex, I never remember, towards sort of like the, the, the soft part of it, let's say that's convex towards the convex part of the Luna. So sheet flow is sort of when you have overland water moving and that's what causes reeling and erosion and all the bad stuff we don't like, right? So as sheet flow is moving across the landscape, when the water hits some of these large Lunas, what happens is the power of the water dissipates. So when you have a dissipation of the power of the water, you have a reduction in erosion. What also happens, which is a secondary benefit, is that that water picks up a bunch of seed and nutrients and organic material. And when it hits that concave, convex, I don't remember which one I said, but when it hits sort of that Luna, it deposits all that stuff, all that organic material, all that duff, all that litter, all the um, seeds in that pocket. And you actually get this really nice area of growth. These, This is a Google image of some um, Lunas that I'm working with in um, the Altar Valley. And I probably should have zoomed in on some, but what you can actually see is towards the Northwest side. So the concave, convex side of the, the Luna, it's actually a little darker, right? So you can see a little bit darker areas in that pocket. And what that actually is, is organic material, okay? So these Lunas are awesome because if you get big enough rocks or the rocks sort of function as shading of the soil surface, right? So you get a reduction in seed loss through desiccation stress. There's shading that you can see in this picture right here to the left. And so with that shading, you also get a reduction in soil moisture loss. So it's like a, this nice nursery area for seeds. And so you can employ um, rock lunas by themselves or you can seed into them. This is an image from a rock luna that we seeded into and there are significantly more seedlings right now in and around the rock lunas than in interstitial or non-rock luna areas. Um, and rock lunas are awesome because, because they're just on the um, surface of the soil, you don't have to get um, an archeology span permit because you're not actually penetrating the soil at all to deploy these guys. 
Um, they're super technologically simple to use um, and to deploy. You do need some labor or some big machinery, but you can often get the rocks for free. We got these rocks for free from a mine. Um, so they're, they're, a, they're an excellent sort of um, approach for enhancing the growth of desired plants. Um, if you're interested in Lunas, which I hope you are, this is sort of the Bible of uh, rock work. It's called Let the Water Do the Work. It's by Bill Dyke and Van Clothier, which I imagine some of you have probably heard of these guys. Um, they like to do a nice circuit around the Southwest giving um, uh, workshops in person. They probably haven't had one in the last year, but they give amazing workshops that they teach you how to do this stuff. Um, it's not free, but you can learn most of the stuff from this book, which is a little cheaper than the workshop. But I, I strongly suggest you check this book out um, and it'll tell you all about how to use and deploy, how to how to design and deploy rock lunas and other rock structure types like to reduce reeling and other types of erosion control. Um, you don't have to just use rocks. You can really use piles of anything. Branches are another really good way of doing this because a lot of us uh, have a lot of juniper or, and or mesquite on our landscapes that we want to get rid of. So we cut down the branches and what do you do with them? You can use them for barbecue, I guess, or you can make these sort of branch piles that do the exact same um, function as the fertile islands or as the rock lunas. So you have these areas that um, the soil surface is shaded. So you get this nicer area, um, uh, ideal conditions for germination establishment. It's harder for animals to get into these spaces to actually nibble on the growing um, seedlings. And um, you can use these by themselves or you can seed into them. Um, this picture on the left shows a uh, branch pile that's a little too thick. So you're probably not gonna get growth right under that branch pile, but on the outside, this is a branch pile that wasn't seeded. And you can already see in the front of the picture, there's some green that's a different color green that's actually native plants that started growing because of the shading from these rock uh, from these um, branch piles. They're also really, really good for wildlife. Um, smaller wildlife, not the ones you can shoot, but um, really cool birds and lizards and things like that. So if you're into that, this is another um, excellent approach. Okay, so that, those were just a couple technologically simple approaches that have been shown to be really, really uh, useful in addressing the challenge of rain scarcity and infrequency for um, range seeding. So the next thing is please, the, the next, please. yeah. Um, be, before you move on, uh, just to cover, there's a question about Luna's. Oh. Um, before we move on, I want to-, to Yeah, that. that's cool. Uh, let's go up here. Sorry guys, let me see. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. How, okay, how great. Dangerous, how dangerous are truck tires for the environment when used for Luna's? Yeah, good call. <laughs> yeah, um, so obviously there's going to be some truck, uh, there's going to be track uh, uh, tire issues. So what we did is actually we hired a lot of people. We had a dump pile right on the side of the road and then we used people to move the rock. And so you're kind of the, the, the um, uh, lessening the disturbance to the habitat, um, you're going to have to pay more in labor. Um, we haven't done sort of a cost benefit of how much it would cost to rent like a wildcat or something to actually move them, but you know, this stuff is heavy. So you, it, there's going to be some, some um, unintended effects on the landscape for sure. We have tried, we've looked at um, doing lunas with smaller rocks. So it's easier to move. It's sort of less of a disturbance because it's less heavy. Smaller rocks do not appear to be as good as larger rocks because it's harder to sort of um, pile the rocks in a way that there's actually space for the seeds to grow and germinate, right? You need uh, most seeds, especially the seeds of our species, whether they're either native or forage, they need actually sunlight and certain amount of sunlight every day to germinate. So if you've got a bunch of seeds under these tiny little rocks and there's no sunlight, they won't germinate and they won't grow. I hope that answered the question. Cool. Uh, I, 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 mi I missed it because I was shooting a dog away, but did you address the tires? Yeah, I think I addressed the tires, which is essentially like, we can't do anything about it. You got to, you know, drop your rocks off like right at the road and just hire some people to move the rocks around. Well, I, I, I get, I think what they're asking is using truck tires instead of the branches or rocks. Like, oh, like tires, so maybe. that's a cool idea. So truck tires would be awesome for making depressions in which would keep, um, uh, keep the water in for longer and you would get slight um, shading, right? Because there is a little bit, but I, I'm i not sure that you would get the same amount of shading. I'm not sure you would get the same amount of shading that you would from rocks. 
but you would with that depression and with sort of the grooves, you would probably also get really nice um, collection of organic material as well and seed. So that's an awesome idea that I've actually never thought about. Whoever said that, I want to talk to you later. That, that's cool. Yeah, there's all there's all kinds of stuff. So the, also the stuff I'm talking about um, here are things that I'm um, kind of directly involved with in research in my work. So I'm more confident about talking about these things to you. But there's a, sort of a world of stuff out there that people do that seems to work that maybe there's no formal sort of experiments on it that we do like egghead science on, but maybe it works. And, you know, uh, so this is not the be all end all. Um, for sure. But yeah, truck tires, that's awesome. Or anything that sort of enhances sort of natural depression. I mean, there's other uh, effects of truck tires, which might be like you get some, um, uh, uh, you're like packing the soil and so there would probably be some unintended negative consequences, but um, maybe the positive consequences, the positive effects would um, outweigh the negative cons uh, unintended effects. I don't know. That's cool. That's an awesome question. Um, Thanks, Andrew, and feel free to stop me because I'm kind of not paying attention to Q&A. Okay, so let's say you've been super lucky or you have some divine insight and you know it's going to rain tomorrow and then you know it's going to rain a week after that and a week after that. You've got to get your seed down. Uh, you need to make sure the seed is there once you put it down uh, and it doesn't blow away or it's there to germinate. And I think everyone here probably knows that ants are kind of important critters in, in these systems. Um, but I personally think, and I definitely did this as well, I think ants are super underestimated in how much they can move seeds. So a single ant nest can have 2 million ants in it. And that single nest can move like 150 pounds of seed in four days. And so if that's one ant nest, imagine all the ant nests that are out on a landscape. And some of these ant nests are, are like 10 meters or less away from each other. So you might put all that seed down, walk away, go back home, have a cup of coffee. It rains like three hours later and you're like, I'm golden. Well, maybe three, three hours, but it rains the next day and you're like, I'm golden. Maybe all that seed is already down in the ground. It's not gonna germinate, okay? So how do we deal with that? Well, the first thing is, is seed balls. So seed balls are another thing that like, I love talking about. So you put seed on the ground and there's all kinds of things that can happen to it before it germinates to make it not germinate, right? You can have an animal pick it up and eat it or put it underground. You can have the wind blow it somewhere. You can have an animal come by and step on it and put it too hard into the ground and then it's covered by soil. Also, the monsoons we have around here, all that rain that comes down from the monsoons is a lot of force on the ground. And what happens is every drop of water that comes down on the ground displaces soil a little bit, right? So if there's a lot of rain and there's a lot of soil displacement, what we see in places like the Great Basin anyway, is that all those seeds get covered with sort of a fine film of dirt. And then the next day when it starts to dry out, that dirt hardens and becomes a crust. So all those seeds might germinate, but the seedlings aren't going to be able to penetrate that crust, okay? So there's this myriad of things that might keep a seed from germinating. And seed balls might be the savior of everything because they kind of address all that stuff. So what are seed balls? Seed balls, very generally, are these small structures that are made mostly of seed, a little bit of water, clay, and soil. You mix this stuff together and you let it dry and what you have are these balls. And if you throw these balls out on the landscape, the size and heaviness of the balls keeps the seed from blowing away. For the most part, seeds are protected inside the structure from being eaten because the balls are sort of elevated off the ground. They won't really get covered by that, um, the, the soil once there's movement from rain. Um, and uh, the clay, the kind of clay you use, which is a fire clay, it comes off with about a little less than a quarter inch of rain. So after a germinating rain, that clay comes off and what you have is like a little pool of seeds that are germinating in a little pool of resources, that soil. So after those seeds germinate, that um, the seedlings you have growing have a little bit more resources to keep going. Um, Seed balls are awesome because you can make a bunch and then throw them out on the landscape and forget about them. If it doesn't rain for two months, the seed balls will protect the seeds inside. They won't die from desiccation stress. Um, they're super easy to make, don't need any fancy machinery, um, and they're fairly cheap. Um, a 50 pound bag of the fire clay you need for this stuff is like $5. Um, I've done this with people of every age and stripe and, and people love making them. Um, if you're interested in seed balls, I'm like obsessed with them. Um, on my website, cornishlab.com, there's a link. 
that says outreach and on that outreach uh, page, you'll find a bunch of different things. Feel free to cruise around. But one of the things you'll find is a document that tells you how to make seed balls. Um, anyone can make them, they're super easy. Uh, you can make them by hand and they're great for range because if you're not the kind of rancher that's got enough money for like a drone or a plane, fly your seeds over. Um, they're super easy to throw from the back of an ATV, super easy to throw from the back of a horse. In fact, um, something people do in Brazil is they put these little pouches on dogs and put seed balls on dogs and then they just have the dogs run around. And as the dogs are running, they're kind of going like this and the seed balls are just bouncing out. They're, it's, it's awesome. Um, you do have to make these things by hand um, and they're very easy to make. And if you want to make like a hundred, it might take you two hours, but usually you want about 10 per meter squared. So if you've got a couple hundred acres, it's going to be really hard to make these things by hand. So one of the things you can do is make a bike that makes, um, that turns into this machine that essentially you can make thousands of seed balls in like six minutes. So also on my website in the um, outreach section, you can find a guide that tells you how to turn a bicycle into a seed ball making machine. It's amazing. I also have some videos about seed balls. Um, they're very campy, but they're useful. Uh, so I thought seed balls were like the savior of everything. I was like, these do everything, like animals can't eat them, blah, blah, blah. And then I did an experiment where I threw out a bunch of seed balls and nothing germinated. And I came back a couple of days later and I saw ants were cracking into the seed balls with those huge mandibles of theirs. And they were actually cracking the seed balls open and taking the seed and going underground with them. And I was so angry, um, but other people have actually had this problem too. One of the things you can do if you're into seed balls and you notice that um, ants or other animals are getting into your seed balls, you can actually mix a little bit of cayenne pepper into the seed balls. It seems to work for um, uh, small mammals. Uh, we're on the fence whether it works for ants, but something else that works for ants is if you take some ants and grind them up and put them in the seed balls, that, apparently works really well for keeping ants away from seed balls. I don't know what's going on. It's probably something in the, the um, cuticle chemical, but um, that's what works. So you got to grind that stuff up. Um, so let's say you don't want to do deal with seed balls or you want another sort of thing to think about when you're choosing your species. So um, ants particularly, and I'm really harping on the ants because I, I just, the work I've done here for only four years, I've had so many experiments and these are all seeding experiments like destroyed from ants moving literally hundreds of pounds of seed in a matter of days. Okay. And so I, when I talk to people, they're like, yeah, ants suck. They eat a lot of stuff. Sometimes they bite. Um, but I don't think they're aware of how much ants are taking stuff off the ground before the rain even comes. Something we've been learning is that ants don't like dealing with seeds that have a lot of stuff on them, a lot of appendages, like really long awns or this fluffy stuff or whatever. Um, so seeds are, are really awesome. They come in these all shapes and sizes and whatever. So if you have this sort of list of species from which you're willing to choose a couple for range seeding and you don't know which ones you're going to pick, maybe they're all the exact same price. You can get them all from your friends and you don't know which of these 10 species you want to pick from your list of 30. Well, if you're in an area with ants, which pretty much anywhere in mid Arizona South, there's tons of ants everywhere and probably north of that too, but I don't know about that. But if you're in an area that you see a lot of ants on the ground, try to choose species that have a lot of appendages on their um, seed coat. The ants are way less likely to pick those species up. If you have no choice and all of your um, desired species have these nice seed coats, then ants will actually choose species that have higher protein content. So what you might wanna do is buy a whole bunch of sterile wheat, that's sterile wheat, and you can dump those um, super protein rich uh, seeds somewhere far away from where you're doing your range seeding. And all the ants will actually go and spend time picking up that sterile wheat seed and leave your range species alone, hopefully. Uh, you know, if it's out there like three weeks, they'll get to it, but it'll buy you like five days. Okay, so that's, that's dealing with the seed issue. But what about, let's say you get that seed on the ground, the rain comes before the ants are able to get there and you have some growth, okay? Then you have to deal with seedling desiccation and herbivory. And I have no other slides other than this one because I have yet to figure out how to solve this challenge. And I think a lot of people have yet to figure out how to solve this challenge. Most of us are seeding kind of coincident with the monsoon, which means that we have a lot of stuff growing in the winter or later. And so what that means is most of the stuff that we're putting down the ground is green when it grows, when everything else is brown. So it's just like a big old salad bar for herbivores. And I don't know yet what you're supposed to do to get these guys to stay away from your, your stuff. You could stay out there and try to shoot them or trap them, but there's too many of them. Um, 
So I don't know what the answer is yet. I do know that the rock structures and the, um, the fertile islands and the branch piles, people suggest that it does keep animals, not just large ungulates and, and livestock, but small animals as well. It's a little harder for them to get into those seedlings. Um, but I don't know yet of any formal studies that look at that. So there's suggestions from managers and people who work out in the land that that works. Um, but I don't know yet. So if anybody here has any um, uh, tips of, of how that works, I'm happy to like put some effort into researching it. Okay, so arid systems, rain sheeting is super hard, but is not impossible. Um, you know, the very, very general ideas are seeding in the right place at the right time will enhance success. Keeping that seed on the ground until it rains. So if you seed and then you walk away for a week and it doesn't rain for a week, there's so much stuff that can be happening to that seed. So you should keep an eye on it. And of course, you want to protect the seed from disturbance. How you do that, it is not yet a black box, but it's almost there, right? Um, and I want to remind you that rain sheeting sort of doesn't operate independently of other management um, things that you guys are doing, right? It's not. It's only one tool in the tool belt. So there's all kinds of other stuff that that can go into sort of the rain sheeting family of preparing your soil through tilling or putting down AMF inoculation, livestock management, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, there is no sort of silver bullet for rain seeding, but that's because rain seeding isn't just one thing in itself. There's all this other stuff going on. So um, I, I hope, if anything, that this presentation gave you a little bit more optimism, at least if, if you're totally against rain seeding, which I know a lot of people are, um, give you just a little bit more optimism that there are things that you can try that would, that have been shown for other regions to enhance uh, range seeding success. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent. And you've got <clears throat> a few. Um, cool. So how about using natural rock piles? Natural rock piles are great. So natural rock piles can be treated almost like fertile islands. You can choose those rock piles and seed right into them. And as long, again, as the rocks are sort of big enough so that when you look over it, you can see some of the surface, that's a great thing to use. Okay, super. So here's another. In the high country of Northern Arizona, would winter seeding be beneficial if we know there's a good chance of snow cover? What species of seed would be able to lay dormant until the weather warms up? And would seed balls work in this scenario? Did you get that all? Yes. <laughs> um, and whoever asked that is not gonna be happy with my answers. So in terms of species, um, it depends on what county you're in, like what soil type, whatever, but I can help you with that. I have, um, I developed a tool that helps you choose species um, based on where you are. So you can, that person should email me and I will send them that tool. And so there's that. Um, seed balls, I've never seen any study that has looked at um, using seed balls under snow. I'd have to think about that. I don't, I don't know if the snow, because of the cold, sort of the seed ball would be uh, would remain sort of intact until the snow, until it started warming up and the snow started to melt. In that case, that would be great, right? But, but I don't know if the snow just being on top of the seed ball, like that would be enough moisture on the seed ball to, to, um, to get the, I'm sorry, I'm thinking this is really interesting to get the clay off. I don't know. I'd be, I'd be really interested in testing that whoever that is, if you want me to come out and throw some seed balls and do an experiment, I'd be interested in that. So that answer, I don't know. Um, and the, there was another question. What species are best for dormancy? I'll give you the tool. Seed balls under snow, I don't know. And then there was a third thing. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, what species can lay dormant? You got that. Would winter seeding be beneficial? And would seed balls? I think you got them all. Yeah, so unfortunately, here, I'm going to put my email back in this um, the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, arizona.edu, yeah. Okay, um, right, that's our new email. Uh, yeah, I, it, it depends and I don't know, but I'd be really interested in testing that. So please email me. I'm not trying to brush you off, I just, uh, yeah. Okay, so we got, oh, we got two quick questions, but we're coming into the break here. So just, uh, I'll throw them at your way and okay. then, and I will be, I will be here. I'm going to be making dinner for my family, but I will be on after Aaron, with Aaron Stock and afterwards. Okay. So four wing salt bush, so mm -hmm. those male and female flowers on different plants. What percent of the seeds from random plants are fertile? 
or fertile? Fertile, fertile. I, oh, I have, I have no idea. I, I couldn't even guess. I couldn't okay. even guess. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. But you know what? If that person emails me, I will find you the answer because I'm sure somebody knows the answer. I will find you the answer. Okay. And she has her email in the chat right now. Yes. And then the last one, have you looked at scarifying or slash scraping hundreds of acres of flat native rangeland? Ooh, I haven't. That seems um, like it would be really, it, it would be hard. Um, I've done some, I've done some work um, in the Great Basin and a little bit of work here in Arizona where we've done tilling. And this is like with a hand tiller and small experimental plots. So it's, it's not sort of management. It's not as relevant, um, but we haven't found any huge uh, benefit of doing that. There's reasons why it should, right? It creates sort of um, topography mm -hmm. where seeds can sit and capture soil and things like that. Um, but I haven't found, particularly when it's super dry, I haven't found there to be any effect. Okay, and with that, we certainly thank you for the presentation and you will be available at the yeah. end. But Definitely. right now we